I would like to open this event by recognizing that McGill University is on land which long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse indigenous people whose presence have enriched this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. Avant de donner le coup d'envoi à cet événement, permettez-moi de souligner que l'Université McGill est située sur un territoire qui a longtemps été un lieu de rencontre et d'échange pour les peuples autochtones, notamment pour les nations Haudenosaunee et Anishinaabe. Nous saluons et remercions les divers peuples autochtones qui ont enrichi de leur présence ce territoire, lequel accueille aujourd'hui des gens de partout dans le monde. Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir à tous. My name is Mark Weinstein, and I'm the Vice Principal of University Advancement at McGill. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this bicentennial at-home homecoming event hosted by the McGill Alumni Public Policy Society, also known as MAPS. This group is a great way for alumni who are working in public policy to stay connected to McGill and to each other and make the most of the university's global network. It is so rewarding for me to see new alumni groups like MAPS flourish and become part of the growing community of graduates that make up the McGill Alumni Association. It is especially exciting for the McGill community to come together during this special year as we celebrate the university's bicentennial. For 200 years, McGill has achieved great milestones and made lasting contributions to science, culture, business, the arts, and every facet of our changing world. Two of the university's more recent milestones were the creation of the Max Bell School of Public Policy in 2017 and the launch of the Master of Public Policy program in 2019. As McGill begins its third century, it has never been more important to train strong policy leaders who can bring a fresh perspective to the complex global challenges that affect us all. I can't wait to see what our public policy scholars will be able to accomplish in the coming years. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce the two remarkable graduates who will be leading this event. Narusha Sentilnathan is the founder and president of MAPS. She graduated with a Master of Public Policy in 2020 as part of the first cohort of the program. Narusha is now a senior policy analyst at the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and she's committed to developing a human rights-based approach to housing policy that prioritizes vulnerable and marginalized communities. Nurusha will be joined by the Vice President of MAPS, Shirley Zhang, who will be moderating tonight's panel discussion and Q&A session. Shirley is also one of the graduates of the inaugural MPP class and has been working as a policy analyst for the Canadian federal government for over three years. She previously worked for the Canadian Armed Forces, which allowed her to take part in a high Arctic expedition. Today, She continues to serve as a reservist. Thank you, Narusha and Shirley, for the important work you and the rest of the team are doing to bring McGill's public policy enthusiasts together. The topic of tonight's event is artificial intelligence and the future of public policy. Stay tuned for a fascinating discussion on the tough choices we have to make about regulating the use of AI and conducting data-driven policy making. Thank you all once again for joining us. Now over to you, Narusha. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you to Mark Weinstein for the introduction. As he mentioned, my name is Narusha and I'm the president of the McGill Public Policy Society, also known as MAPS, which is supported by McGill University Advancement and the Maxwell School of Public Policy. So I'd like to thank them both. Before we start, I do want to recognize, particularly in light of tomorrow, marking the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada, that it's all of our collective responsibilities, those who have settled, migrated, or sought refuge here to work towards decolonization and reconciliation on this land and commit to addressing historical um, and ongoing injustices committed against Indigenous communities. This is of particular relevance to any panel on public policy given that the role of policies historically have contributed to or failed to address systemic oppression. 
Now, moving into today's discussion around AI and the future of public policy, we hope to highlight the importance of good public policy and address the intersections between an ever-changing society faced with social, environmental, ethical challenges and AI's implications in all of it, both as solutions for these issues and a realm which can come with its own set of challenges and considerations for policymaking and policymakers. Shirley Zhang is our moderator today, um, who I've gotten the privilege to work with as the Vice President of MAPS. I'm happy to welcome also our extremely accomplished and insightful speakers tonight. First up, we have Valentin Godard, Founder and Executive Director of AI Impact Alliance, an independent nonprofit organization whose mission is to facilitate an ethical and responsible impl implementation of AI and a United Nations expert on digital governance and policy. Second, we have Eunice Mercado Lara, Civic Science Fellow at the Open Research Funders Group, former project manager for the AI training programs at Montreal New Tech, and former deputy director for science and technology policy at the National Council of Science and Technology in Mexico. Third, we have Joel Pinot, who is an associate professor and William Dawson Scholar at the School of Computer Science at McGill, where she co-directs the Reasoning and Learning Lab. She's a core academic member of Mila and Kanda Sifar AI shareholder. She's also co-managing director of Facebook AI Research. Finally, we have Mark Shen, Associate Assistant Deputy Minister for Strategy and Innovation Policy at the Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development. Prior to becoming a DM, Mark was a Director General at the Marketplace Framework Branch, Policy Branch at ISAID. Shirley, speakers, I will happily give you the floor and audience, feel free to submit your questions directly to me via chat, which we'll get to at the latter half of this session. Thanks everyone. We're thrilled to have an exceptional lineup of panelists joining us. Our goal today is that whatever your role is in the industry, that you will come away with something like a new idea or a fresh perspective. So without further ado, we will start the discussion for today. First off, so we think there is a dual relationship between the digitalization processes and public policy. The first has to do with the regulation of AI in society, and the latter has to do with the data-driven policymaking. What are the near terms of impacts of AI on policymaking? Um, why don't we start with you first, Mark? Thanks so much, Julie, and, and great to be here. Um, I definitely um, think there's a lot in this question, obviously, related to both the, the digitization processes that are happening within public policymaking and then, and then obviously the regulation um, of AI in, in many ways. So I, I think it's probably worth stating at first that um, it, policymaking itself is obviously fundamentally shifting. We have, we have vast amounts of new information that's available to us and often an incapacity to be able to, to, to understand that information with the sole usage of, of, of just humans. Um, um, and so in that regard, I think, you know, it raises the question of the degree to which AI will become an important part of it. I'd say we're, we're still at, a, at an early stage of that in many cases. Um, and the government of Canada has understood that. We have, we have Canada's directive on automated decision making that's assisting us in many ways in the government of Canada context, um, at least to understand the ways in which AI might be a tool with proper caveats, you know, safeguards and considerations as part of our policymaking suite. The other, however, is then obviously the, the 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 flip side impact, which is all types of policy in many ways has to now grapple with how AI might be coming into impact and to impact the, the the zones in which public policy has 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 a domain, and and that's really an endless kind of practice in some ways because we have to think about it at the macro level in terms of the broad scale of regulation and the broad sort of sweeping considerations around just kind of uses of technology itself. And then we have to think about it in almost every vertical and in almost every sort of setting. And, and, and there will need to be a, a sort of macro consideration. And I think we are underway with having a macro consideration of what role there will be for kind of norm setting and ethics, what role there'll be for marketplace framework policies or laws of general application that potentially speak to the entirety of the technology, 
what role they'll be for sector specific or, or kind of activity based regulation in a, in a particular vertical, and then where we might go towards individual conceptions around things like, you know, um, standards, certifications, codes, um, various mechanisms that may that may enable um, actors beyond government to be able to be part of the, the process of, of ensuring the effective usage of these technologies and tools. So, so I'd really say, you know, um, early days in some ways, although we're, we're well into this technology, but but in some ways still kind of getting the codification of this right. And it, and it will really play in both spots. It will play on how we make policy and then over what we make policy. Thank you so much for the comments. Um, Eunice would like to add on a bit more on this. Yeah, thanks, Shirley. I like how, how Mark draft the, the answer because it's it's basically policy making on something which is AI and making policy based on AI. You know, for the for the first one, I think most of the discussions and most of the tools and the references are going to come from the fields that we are seeing emerging with from a, from law, AI regulations, and all, most of the criteria are going to to come from, from those fields. And I think that public policy is going to have, or governments in specific, are going to have macro, pro, macro, macro, macro challenges on how to protect, from, from what I see, it's protecting human rights, regulate markets, and stimulate economic growth. So they are the macro challenges for, for AI regulation. And, and if we can think about them, those three goals themselves have, have Often they are not overlapping. Oftentimes they have conflicting objectives. When you're trying to regulate a market, you oftentimes are hurting other sectors, or you are not. And if you are, if you're trying to regulate markets in order to protect individual rights, then you are going to maybe harm the economic growth. So that's going to be the tension. That's going to be like the, at the macro level. For the second part of your question, I think on data-driven policy making. The, the most evident and foreseeable challenge is going to be how we policymakers understand public policy. At every public policy school, we've learned that there's a policy cycle and that and we have stages. But what's going to happen now? We are going to have more data, more available faster, and all the feedback loops of the policies are going to be shorter. So how are we going to adapt to that new policy cycle? I think we are going to, are we going as, as an institution or government, government agency be ready to adapt to that fast paced policy cycle? I think that, that, that's, that to me the fast, is the fascinating dimension of, of this discussion. How government officials and agencies are going to adapt to a process that's going to be very fast paced. Yeah, like we're all concerned about like where AI is leading us or like or us leading AI and that, like, that's why we're here today. So the second question will be, how should AI be governed? Like um, back to what Mark mentioned earlier, like government practices. So what kinds of like governance practices, guidelines or assurance are needed in the development and deployment of AI to foster like responsible and trustworthy uses of technology. Uh, why don't we go with you first here, Joao? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Shirley. Um, I think perhaps it's useful to just take a step back and, and, and really think about what is AI. Um, and, and so, you know, I think in a sense, AI is is an extremely vast topic. It's really the emergence of intelligence through data and computation, right? If you take it like that, in a sense, the notion of defining policy on AI is in some sense akin to saying you want to regulate the usage of math, right? And, and, and of course that is so broad as, as to be um, a, a bit meaningless. It, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't engage with the question, but I'm just saying we have to be careful about how we frame the work that we're trying to do. In essence, AI applies anywhere that you might want to do data-driven decision-making. So imagine the vast set of use cases in today's society where you want to do data-driven decision-making. This is what you're working with. 
So I think a really much more practical approach is to look at specific use cases, look at specific domains, look, for example, whether it's in transportation and healthcare, in the telecom, in defense, natural resources, the questions are going to be vastly different because the nature of the data is different. Is it personal data? Is it data that's coming from sensors? Is it data that's coming from the natural world? The nature of the data is different. The nature of the questions that you're using is different. And the nature in which you're using the algorithms is different. Whether you're applying those algorithms to the justice system is very different than if you're trying to predict the growth of corn in a field. And so you really have to look at the complexity of these use cases. There are no shortcuts for that, um, but I think that's really how we have to th start thinking about it. So if we go back to your question, you know, what, what are some of the preliminaries we, we need to do? You know, the first thing I would insist on is really education, a deep understanding of the techniques of AI to be able to derive policy that is appropriate to the use cases a deep sense of collaboration. We need to work in a space between expertise in AI and between deep domain expertise in these different fields. So a strong spirit of collaboration to do that and a lot of transparency in order to, in order to, achieve, to achieve our goals there. Yeah, totally. Like a lot of transparency, especially it's like such a complex topic and then applying different domains and everything. Would you like to add a bit more like that you're coming from uh, international organization's work of Valentin. Um, thank you, Shirley. And uh, thank you, Joelle, for, for your, um, your in introduction. Um, of course, I come from a completely different perspective. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Um, so when I talk about uh, governance, I look uh, very much at what you were talking about, like from data to the algorithmic result. So what data are we collecting who is developing um, AI? What type of algorithms do we choose? What business models are influencing which AI technologies we decide to develop? Um, who collects the data and for what purposes? What are the algorithmic outputs and how do we regulate that output uh, in, in various um, sectors? So that's called the social technical pipeline. At the beginning of the pipeline, there's just society. There's historical biases uh, that we're trying to, to fix. So in, in that perspective, I just want to align my answer along that social technical pipeline. There are different ways that policy can intervene. There's funding policies that can intervene and support better data collection practices uh, in funding policies that can support, for example, uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations that strive to achieve sustainable development goals in their data collection and uh, how they can build an architecture and whether they have access to the, the basic uh, fundamentals of having access to AI so that they can also be part of the development process. And then at the other end of the pipeline, in terms of uh, governance, who is governing AI right now? What ethical frameworks exist and who had the opportunity, because I think at this stage, it's still a privilege to be part of those who are participating in the frameworks um, that become the guidelines to how we develop and deploy AI in, into society. So I'm trying to keep track of time. I think I still have four, about 45 seconds. I took a couple of notes. And one thing that's extremely important is the underrepresentation of women in AI from a technical perspective, but also from a STEAM perspective. Uh, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, including the humanities and mathematics. Um, by having a STEAM-based approach design and governance um, of AI, it allows a huge influx of women into the design process and the governance process. Same thing by including more civil society organization in that in a pipeline process. Um, along the pipeline, we could increase the number of women uh, and have... Um, or gender balanced digital economies and digital democracies moving forward. I'll save the rest for later. Sounds good. Uh, diversity and inclusion is uh, very crucial in many different areas nowadays, and uh, it can definitely enrich our uh, future foreseeable work in this area. Um, I'm wondering if, would you like to say a few words on this, Mark, since it's on governance? Sure, happy to, to add in. I mean, I, I I think my my colleagues have given really important contributions to to some initial framing around around this, and and I think I would just add, 
you know, in some ways, I, I totally take Joelle's point that in some ways these use cases are going to be the most the most useful. I think some of the challenges is our instrumentation um, isn't always as easy to be adaptable to, to 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 use case specific sort of examples in some ways, and that we have a challenge in some ways at the at the at the blunt instrument of law or the blunt instrument of of a standard or the blunt instrument in some ways of of a code in terms of trying to anticipate all of those specific use cases and and kind of think through the governance of them. So, so in some ways, maybe I would I would say, you know, as we start to approach the governance of artificial intelligence, in one way, one thing we have to reassure people is um, there are existing frameworks that actually do apply to, to the usage of artificial intelligence. We have a, 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 a protection of personal information statute that exists at the federal level as well as at, at, at all provincial and territorial levels. Um, you know that that does protect personal information and its usage. And and when when we were thoughtful and when we got it right, we actually were a bit um, future proofing in some of the design of those to allow for them to adapt to emerging technology as opposed to being really really hardwired towards you know the personal information and the use of the fax machine, which thankfully our our statute isn't 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 there. Um, but we also have laws around around a number of kind of of the specific applications. Um, but but then I think we need to think about entry points and 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 to to Valentin's point, which I think is really critical, who who is being governed and and who is most impacted by some of these. And so when I when we think about the incremental pieces of governance that we need to add, we kind of start at the existing, then we need to think about what can we do generally and what do we need to do specifically to some of Joelle's points. And then what's the best instrument? And and then we also need to think about what's the level we want to get at so there's provincial territorial laws there's municipal laws there's a, then you know considerations around international norms and ethics so and you know from a government of canada perspective we have that all the way from kind of the global partnership on artificial intelligence so really you know big international kind of consideration of some of these early ethical issues all the way through to the to the very specific you know uh, a code of conduct that exists in the transportation sector around the use of a, of, of, a, of autonomous vehicles um that's really around the kind of um, consideration of safety in a very particular context and and so you know not to kind of daunt the the, the audience but i do think it really is both that wide and that deep in some regards. And to, Val to Valentin's point, each one of those necessitates a bit of a consideration of like, have we gotten it right? Have we have we thought through really who is impacted and who needs to be involved in kind of considerations around the effective usage of those? Because, because that really does become clear. You actually touched a bit on what I was gonna ask next, like how can we ensure Canadian help to ensure Canadians are ready for the societal change and that will result from the advancements of AI technology. Um, perhaps like Joao can um, do a little rebuttal on that or uh, provide some of her thoughts on this topic. How can we ensure Canadians are ready for the societal change? Yeah, I don't think I will rebut too much. You, we may have a panel that agrees a little, a little too much, but all right, I'll I'll highlight two points that I think are, are really relevant here. You know, one is just really emphasizing the the point that Mark made earlier is that we do already have a lot of legal infrastructure that can be used to guide us in in many places. You know, what we're trying to do in AI in many cases is very narrow AI, right? We're talking about like prediction algorithms, taking data to predict certain quantities. And in a lot of cases, how the data is collected, handled, and so on is quite well defined. And what we can, should, or should not predict is also quite well defined. So to some degree, really leaning on the infrastructure that we have built as a society um, is already a good, a good way to do it. The other point I will reemphasize, and this is the point uh, Valentin brought to the, the table already, is really the need for education. And I think education goes in several directions. The, the number of people across society who don't have any understanding of, of AI and yet interact with algorithms based on AI on a daily basis, it, it essentially assume that all of your interactions on the web are mediated by AI algorithms. And yet people have very um, lacking in understanding of these. So that aspect of education and but similarly you know the people developing the algorithms developing the techniques tend to have rather narrow technical training and perhaps not be fully educated in terms of the broader social context in which their tools are going to be deployed 
So I'm a strong advocate for multidisciplinary training and collaboration in, in trying to solve these problems. Valentine, would you like to talk? Well, that's the perfect place for me to hop in. Thank you, Joelle. Um, I am a huge advocate for the role of civil society organizations, nonprofit organizations that uh, are already uh, working with citizens, um, either to uh, in the field of education or uh, getting back to uh, to work or work transitions or uh, welcoming new Canadians to Canada. Those are civil society or, or, or in climate change or um, these, those are the organizations that are already working and have the trust of, of citizens and have developed that expertise in terms of how to relay information in the best way to um, our citizens or Canadian citizens. And um, within the civil society organization sector, I've been focused for the past uh, many years now on the role of art for social change and the role of art for um, social innovation in the field of AI, the role of art in better understanding, engaging citizens uh, in better understanding uh, and being part of the change. Because I think my initial uh, reaction when I saw the, the question that you asked is the best way to be ready for change is to be part of the change. And art is one of those just most powerful tools that we can uh, find to bring information at um, various Publics um, across the country and engage into that iterative process that Mark was talking about. You know, it's such a large topic and it needs to be ongoing. I think maybe it was Eunice who was saying, it's like, well, it, it can't stop. And that iterative process can happen through um, art projects. So I've been proposing and submitting various publications on multidisciplinary design of machine learning as well as inter arts it's a new it's, it's a field that's recognized by the Canada Art Council that relates for example different fields to uh, to each other that are not necessarily are all artistic so I relate the uh, art AI and and law together into uh, artistic interve interventions that engage citizens into those, those discussions and lead to uh, support democratic processes in the adoption of, of evolving regulation. We have existing regulations, um, and but I think some of them are still moving and advancing. There's the digital, um, uh, the, the Data Governance Act that will be adopted in Europe next year. And I hope we have a chance to maybe chat about that one a little bit too, today, uh, later on. So I'll just drop that seed there and maybe we can get back to that one later on. I actually have a follow-up question for you, Valentine. Earlier, um, Joao mentioned like uh, people who are not in the industry, not knowing much about AI, and then they're still interacting with AI every day. So what do you think are the foreseeable um, ethical implications of these AI advancement and their uh, human dimensions? The very quick answer is we risk developing technologies for people who are not part of the developments in the government process. Uh, if we talked about the digital, um, the gendered and regional uh, digital gap, um, if left on its own, is going to continue and increase those inequalities. So um, I think the past, uh, so I'm kind of skipping to the, the last question, I guess, here, in the sense that uh, the past 18 months, pandemic has accelerated digital transformation for the best and the worst. Uh, we have increased access to digital health, uh, uh, remote access to educational tools, uh, AI, uh, in, I think a Canadian research group was able to uh, um, identify like the COVID. So there's, there were huge advantages during this pandemic to the use of AI. At the same time, just the digital acceleration itself has accentuated that digital gender gap. So the in the terms of ethical implications, I'm extreme. That's one of the, the main concerns, I guess, is we need to address that. And in, as policymakers, uh, I think some of the solutions to those ethical dimensions are to put in place gender focused perspectives across the government in the implementation of AI. So, cross governmental or in French, interministériel. Um, I think that is one of the solutions I was going to uh, put 
push forward when we talk about the ethical implications. The most important implication for me right now is underrepresentation of, of certain communities in the field. Yeah, absolutely. I know for Government Canada, in terms of doing their work, they apply like a GPA plus lens, like the gender-based analysis lens. So hopefully that will contribute a bit further in that direction. I haven't asked you any question yet uh, for a while, Eunice. Would you like to talk a bit more on uh, the ethical implication of AI advancement? Yeah, thanks. I, I do agree with Val and with jo Joel. I think it's it's inclusion is is part of this, should be part of the of the of the discussion here. Um, and and oftentimes we believe that by default people on STEAM or STEM are the only ones who have a stake or an organic uh, position on these discussions. But I think from a policy perspective, it'll be important for us to engage with other audiences and not to expect that they how are we going to make this conversation simple to anyone out there because that's the value on it i don't think at the end when you when you read all the potentials of ai i think we we all agree in most of them but when we recognize that it requires the participation of everyone i think it also represents a challenge for policymakers and whichever is working in this domain to engage with others i don't really like when people say that AI is just for this kind of people or for the tech guy or because the real value of AI comes when you get the information and the participation of other audiences. Very, very quickly, what I think is, how are we going to make people to trust the algorithms if they do not feel familiar to algorithms? And being honest, AI is going to take us to ensure we are going to take less decisions as, as, as humans, and we are going to delegate those decisions to algorithms. And if we still believe that algorithms are a black box that we cannot understand, it's gonna be harder for every, anyone to engage in that conversation. Um, what I think can be helpful is to reach out those which are not really, for instance, younger populations. They are more open to have discussions at not necessarily at, at, at the um, technical level, but more into in a database, in a day to day base, for instance, what Joel said, we we have AI in our daily lives, we can have a non technical conversation on AI and its implications, and we can contribute at that level. So how can we ensure that those those conversations and those spaces are prolifer proliferating in places where they can contribute to the agenda. So that's. So the next question we have is shifting from like the individual level to talk about Canada. Um, and I'll ask uh, Joao and Mark separately on this one. So how can we ensure Canada can be a global leader in AI, which includes like research, development, implementation, and government policies that adequately support these. Um, Joao, you go first. Thanks. I, I think it's an I think it's an important question. I, I think it's it may be interesting for for our listeners today to know that in many ways Canada is already playing a strong leadership role, both in terms of the actual research in AI. You know, several poles of research which have been well supported and funded by our governments but also the establishment of several groups who are looking at more the ethical and societal impacts of AI. I'm thinking of Obvia in Quebec, um, which is playing a leadership role on that, on that front. So on both of these fronts, I think we have some very healthy conversations and support. We've already talked about education. I think we have to think of that systematically from you know, the K to 12 to university, all the way to civil society and figure out how to, how to support that. I'll add two points which we've talked about less. One of them is in terms of research funding. In particular, you know, Canada has had some strong dedicated institutes for funding across the disciplines and CERC, CIHR, CHIRC, and so on. I think we have to think holistically of funding AI, not just from a technical and scientific perspective, but from really a multidisciplinary perspective perspective and we have to make sure that the research follows through in that multidisciplinary way as much as we might think that we're only needing to fund algorithms we also need to fund 
you know, the, the studies into the social impact of, of this work. And so really have a holistic strategy on this. Um, I do think the last piece that's really quite important is a, a physical infrastructure for doing some of that work. And so in some cases, that means literally some investment in terms of computation platforms. Canada, in some sense, is a model for how we do that. We've done large investments in Compute Canada, which democratizes access to large computing infrastructure. Many countries are looking at our model for doing that. Um, and so I think that sustained involvement is, is definitely necessary. You know, the types of platform we need for hosting data in a safety and privacy compliant way, as well as the right infrastructure to do the, comp the, the computation. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think we may have lost Shirley. Mark, do you want to take it on from me? I think I'll pass sure. it. Sure. Thanks so much. And I could just build on your points. I mean, I think there's I think there's two ways to cut this in some ways. You know, one is I um I'm a public servant and so I could I could um you know, give a laundry list of things and investments that we've made, whether whether it's the the first version of the Pan Canadian AI strategy or, or or the second version and the and the significant investments we've made. But maybe I'll I'll take your question, Shirley, at a slightly more abstract level, which is, you know, how do we ensure that Canada is a global leader in AI? I I would actually kind of point to four kind of foundational elements that I see as part of our ongoing leadership, particularly because you asked for it, you know, across the continuum, so research, development, implementation, and government policy. So. Fundamentally, um, a, a core element is is trust. Um, you know, I, I actually think we need the trust of our scientific and research community. I think we need the trust of our businesses, but I also think we need the trust of our citizens that this is technology that actually has utility, has value, has 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 significant kind of gains for their overall efforts. Um, second, I think we need scale. Um, this is this is a zone where where there is a, an enormous amount of effort and an enormous amount of competition in terms of global leadership, and I think we need to ensure that that we actually can compete um, at a level that is consistent with our comparative advantage. And and those two things though can't come um, at, their, at their expense. So so scale not um, um, without trust, um, scale scale with trust, and I think that 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 can be our comparative advantage. The, the the third kind of element I'd suggest is is sort of completeness. And I think some of that is actually that, you know, we're not going to be um, able to be potentially competitive or global leader in every aspect of AI. We we've already we've already understood that. Um, so in some ways I think we but that said, I think we need to make sure that we are running the gamut, you know, we, that we're not repeating some of the, the, the issues that Canada's had in other zones, notably that we're foundational and fundamental in research, but then potentially not awesome on, on the execution on the commercialization side. And so I think we need to make sure of the completeness in that regard. But I'd also say completeness in terms of some of the issues that we've raised um, that are really important in some of these other zones. AI is predicated in some ways on scale, scale of data. Um, it's also in some ways predicated on, on a certain amount of completeness and absent completeness has real risks around things like bias. And so in some ways, I think completeness also needs to be that we actually are widening the capacity and, and understanding of the pool of people who are participating and whose information in some ways is participating. And in some ways, if, if we are gonna be a trust um, kind of situated AI model in Canada, um, that, that there is actually that feeling of trust that will allow for the full benefits of it. Um, and then maybe the last thing I would just say is, is one, you know, we've talked about feedback loops. I think this is a zone where if Canada is going to compete, um, we are going to need to make sure that we are we are learning the the the, the mistakes, the course corrections and 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 learning as we go. Um, you know, I was I was really struck by Eunice's comment at the beginning about the fact that we have this heightening speed of 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 the policy cycle. You know, as a public policy scholar myself, I'd say we have not historically been awesome at feedback loops. The the notion that we take program data and and street level bureaucracy and implement it back in program design that's not been a strong point of almost any and any of our of our schemes. And so, how do we actually make sure that in this particular ground, as we as we get some de novo opportunities to be able to create that we actually you know don't repeat those errors and actually ensure it. So, so trust, feedback loop, scale, and, and completeness would be my kind of zones. Thank you, Joanne and Mark. So we have a final question for the uh, panelists before we reach the audience questions. So last question we have is uh, on climate change. What role can AI play in a climate change world? 
Um, why don't you go first on this, Valentine? Sure. Um, so the, the first thing I think what's important to do when we're wondering what AI can do for climate change is take a step back and ask yourself how historically we've been using and implementing new technologies, uh, whether it's acoustic sound or internet or um, other media that uh, transmits information. Um, I think AI is a new technology and to understand the role it played, we need to look at the maybe the root causes of climate change. Uh, climate change is not only an environmental issue, um, there are um, systemic causes um, to that. And now we're in a climate crisis. And so basically we're asking ourselves, sounds to me like this question is, can AI reverse the impact of ignoring for many years science-based warnings and indigenous knowledge warning us of this upcoming crisis? So we can't rely solely on AI to solve a social caused crisis. Um, so the answer, yes, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm an optimist, um, but we will need courageous policies that address the systemic causes that led to this crisis and democratic processes supporting the adoption of regulatory frameworks and digital economies and sustainable business models. Um, I'd like to maybe pause a little bit on that. And we were talking about trust and uh, the various initiatives that already exist in Canada. I think it's important to maybe uh, also have a look at where the funding in AI has been going. And there um, is a research that was done by Anna Brandusescu that you can look up. She's, uh, it's posted on the McGill website, uh, which illustrates the um, funding in AI. Um, I had, um, I made an illustration of the findings and the bubble for funding for the private sector is this big, funding for academia is this big and nonprofit organization civil society is zero. Um, so that would need to change and that I think would be part of the courageous policies that we need to take in order to have more trust in the technology, more education and information about AI that then would lead to maybe perhaps more interest and in even wanting to access it. Um, I went across the country in 2019, just before the pandemic uh, and met with artists um, in every province and territory. The lack of information, all artists expressed, we want more information, we want more access and we do want to be part of the governance. Um, yet it's extremely difficult and I just want to um, uh, bring all our voices together and thank you Joelle for mentioning that today and, and everybody for, but the steam based funding is extreme, those are funding silos that are extremely difficult to break and it it's, has to happen if we want to have uh, sustainable digital economies and democracies. So every inch of the social system that we're building must ensure that AI is geared towards the achievement of Agenda 2030 and the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We can make public funding conditional upon showing that there was a gender-focused evaluation, that there was a social or environmental impact evaluation. That can be done. There are um, international examples of that happening in the maritime sector. Spain did it. And, tripled the number of women that are decisional decision makers now in the maritime sector, another sector where there's not a lot of women. So there's a deep global network of brilliant and caring AI scientists and entrepreneurs for profits and nonprofits using the power of AI to address climate change. And we must give them all the support they need to achieve their important and ambitious goals. We're running out of time. So perhaps Joanne and Eunice can touch on this quickly under like a minute. I'll let you start, Eunice. Thank you. Short answer is uh, I think, yes, it has a role and it can be in optimizing the use of resources and reducing waste. And just to give you three quick examples to bring our brains to those uh, potential areas. Precision ag agriculture, we can reduce or make more efficient the use of water and, and fertilizers in, in crop fields. Um, also for wild and environment conservation, if we are, if we have the capacity to understand 
the flows of rivers or, or, or the paths of whales or, or how, for, for instance, deep learning technology could be used to analyze images of animals captured by motion and it's going, we can use that information to create accurate and detailed policies that we don't have now. So I think there's a the potential, but I agree with, with Val, it's, it's a tool. It's not gonna be the solution of a systemic problem that we've been, <laughs> we've been uh, warned from, from different uh, sectors in the past. And just to finish my intervention, I think there's a big and huge role on, of, of the funders of, of research and science on these on these discussions because from from what I what I've seen is that funders they tend to fund the things they feel confident and with whatever brings them more certainty. And thinking about funding AI related projects which are not at the technical level requires to to illustrate them on which could be the potential impacts of those um, projects. So I think there's a lot to discuss there too, but I agree with Joel and I and I, I agree with, with Val. Sure. I, yeah. I forgot to ask permission at the beginning. Can I just put in the chat a project that I've been uh, working on? It's algorithmic art to counter gender bias in AI. I'll put it in the chat uh, for our participants to see if that's okay. And maybe the good news is that I know funders are working towards making more open and equitable those grant making processes and to include other people in the discussion to, to, to actually engage at different levels, AI and other topics. I was just going to maybe wrap up this question, Shirley, with two comments. One, you know, I'll, I'll go back to, to the point that AI is essentially a tool for data-driven decision-making. So anywhere where we need data to enhance our ability to make good decisions for the climate situation, I think AI can be a tool if used judiciously. The other piece I will add and, and, and maybe leave us with that is that, you know, AI itself has a large energy footprint. And so, you know, we should not ignore this part. We should, you know, ask for our AI to be green as we do with other sectors of our, of our, um, of our economy. And it's on the researchers to really make some efforts towards efficiency, better accountability on, on what is that environmental footprint of AI. There's too much that is running without good reason. And we need to, to you know, look in the mirror um, when we are developing that technology. Thank you, Joe. So the first audience question is actually directed to you. Um, the person asked, can you clarify two to three misconceptions about AI? And like, and then I guess I could follow up what be towards everyone on the panel. Why should AI be governed? I'll pick one misconception so we can have more, more questions and more people. The one that really gets to me is this notion that AI is a black box. I, I, I strongly resist this. I think, you know, um, if anything, humans are a black box much more than AI. Um, if I have an AI algorithm, I can understand what's going in. And if I want to trace back why it's making a certain prediction, I can actually dig into the innards of my model to understand how the input and the output are connected. Why people think it's a black box is sometimes because they don't understand the innards enough. It's also become the algorithms are not good about rationalizing their decisions. So in that sense, the notion of interpretability is missing. On the other hand, humans are complete black box. We have no traceability of what's actually going on in our brains, yet humans are incredibly good at rationalizing, explaining, creating stories and narratives that explain our cognitive process. But there's no accountability whatsoever that the way we tell the story is actually what went on in the brain. So I think that's my you know, number one misconception. AI is not a black box, um, but we need to do much better in terms of enhancing the interpretability of our models. And we do need that because that influences our ability to use them in an appropriate way, in a fair way, and in a way that's consistent with the values of our society.
thank you on that. Um, if no one, uh, does anyone want to comment on why should AI be governed? <laughs> I have to follow start. up on the black box, but we'll go to that next. Uh, yes, well, I was just going to follow up on the black box. Uh, sometimes the humans do create the black box. There are legal black boxes around the use of algorithms. And as much as IP strategies are extremely important in protecting um, the investments we've been, uh, Canadians have been doing in, in the research um, in AI, and we need intellectual property strategies. Uh, at the same time, uh, sometimes it prevents uh, citizens from having access to the real reasons behind why certain uh, services or access are, are being denied. So despite the algorithm itself being sometimes interpretable or explainable, um, I, I often talk about how uh, the art can bring more transparency to AI, for example, because not only does it uh, act as a tool for digital literacy, scientific literacy, um, but it also um, sheds more light onto uh, the legal implications around uh, AI and how sometimes we don't have access to explanations for, for other reasons than the algorithm itself. So yes, it should be governed. Uh, that, sorry, I wasn't on that question. I was just hopping on the Joelle's. Uh, I'm happy to hop in briefly, Shirley. On, I mean, I think I think AI has to be governed. Um, I mean, first of all, maybe my my I'll I'll, I'll steal one of Joelle's um, um, misconceptions or things that things that that drive me nuts is that AI is is this singularity in some regards, and and I think from a from a either a technology a, a use case or or even a governance perspective, I think we have to break down this myth that AI is monolithic and that it's always the same and that it's always going to be, you know, and so, you know, this notion of like, why is AI, why should AI be governed? It, it sort of asks the question as if it's kind of a single use, whereas, whereas it's not. And so I'd still say to answer the question, why does kind of this, the, the many iterations of AI or, or some of the, 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 the plethora of kind of usages and, and considerations around AI need to be governed? In part because it it literally meets the definition of 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 a public commons problem in so many zones. It's that the individual instances of it actually spill over into zones that actually have sincere implications for us as a society in terms of how we organize ourselves and how we act, behaviors that that are potentially manifest, and then and then real world implications for for many of the things that we've already determined need to be regulated at a more macro level than than just at the level of the individual. So so you know you can go in any one of those from you know the notion of of you know the safety of ourselves as we walk down the street because things are potentially predicated on 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 kind of decisions that have been taken about you know what's the appropriate length of time for you know a crosswalk all the way through to to to, to some of the more kind of manifest other implications of of ai in terms of of predictive capacity for other other elements and so so i would say ai has to be governed notwithstanding my my quibble with the notion that ai is is not is not singular um because in many ways it does have this 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 sincere impact that is that is societal and is common notwithstanding that its usage may actually be individual in nature so so my choice to use ai actually does have implications for others in so many instances and those are the ones that i think we need to be really careful about the fact that it actually does require a governance structure that actually exists outside of the human Mm -hmm. And if I just may add, the benefit that AI can bring to society will um, rely on its governance, on the investment policies and the um, political system that it is um, set in. So the, you know, if you look historically at the implementation of new technologies, it is that governance that determined how much benefit the new technology was able to bring. So just a little nitpick I just wanted to add. So on the topic of a black box, um, do you think any of you that like the unexplainable character of the systems that might used in policy making has implication for public accountability? And how do we assure that public trust, for example, when the state uses black box models to make decisions that affect important individual interests? I guess I opened that blog box so I can at least help us see it peer a little bit more into it. Um, I, I think that the, the importance of explainability is directly related to the notion of trust. I think, you know, Mark made a convincing point about why it's absolutely important to, to build up trust. Um, and so 
without that level of explainability, which enables transparency, it's going to be very hard to build up trust. Um, so I think it's absolutely crucial. The piece I will add is there's a period in which it's important to build up trust in, in the life cycle of a particular technology, right? To some degree, all of us are content in the morning to take our favorite transportation method, whether it's a car, whether it's a metro, without really understanding how the thing is driving, the motors, all of the complex system. You fly in a plane and you don't ask too many questions of that um, because you trust in the system. You trust that there's been a strong track record of reliably delivering people from point A to point B. And so it's possible that at some point down the line, in terms of the deployment of AI, we will get to that level of trust that we need less transparency. We're not there right now. There's been a huge shift in the application of this technology. And so this is a period we're deeply understanding it and therefore having the level of transparency that's necessary to, to enhance trust is necessary. And I don't mean just blind trust. I don't mean that you know we just have to get to the point that people put faith into this technology. I mean, trust that is built up through rigor, that is built up through understanding the impact of this technology on a diverse segment of our population. And so this is really what we're trying to achieve. And, and I briefly would like to add that we've been here before, like we've had as a society, we have, we've had these kind of challenges before. Drones are a good example. Like we, we used to be very, just think about when we first saw satellite images. We thought we would be um, spied by whoever. We know that that, that is harder. That is not exactly the straightforward use of, of of these technologies. What I think we can learn from the drones case is that governments, some governments, were more resistant to regulate or to adapt drones into the public agenda and the public discussion. And it did not stop from technology to advance and drones and, 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 and to have another applications. What actually happened is that it disassociated the discussion of the development of technology and the creation of regulation. So what I think it's a good lesson to learn from the cases of, of drones is, I think both should go together. The, the, the evolution of technology solutions and applications and the evolution of the discourse on who is governing and how we are governing the, the, the use of these technologies, I think that's the best combination to build trust among the users and, and yeah. And while we're on the history of, of new technologies, maybe if we look at the history of, of cars, uh, we don't ask explanations anymore about um, cars, uh, yet women still suffer higher prices when we go to the garage station to have our cars fixed. Uh, that's a couple hundred years later. Um, and I think it's important to look at the history of the, the design of cars, who has been more impacted by accidents, who suffers more injuries. Um, so. Yes, we're, we're at an, another at the beginning of that stage with AI, and I think we still have the opportunity to build that that understanding and therefore that trust. And in that understanding, um, I you know just go back to that the, the basics. We need to that trust needs to be um, funded, and and that needs to be supported. Right now, I see more investment going into the development of the technology than in the involvement of the underrepresentation communities that should be part of that discussion. Is it possible that AI, especially like research into explainable AI, could be used to make existing public policy more intelligible to people? Or like in other words, that could we use AI to reverse engineer the black box that is much or towards like public policy, government policy? I mean, I think it's an interesting question, Shirley, and certainly, you know, we, wearing my kind of bureaucrat hat, I'd say, have have been on a journey of trying to get to to more open government and thinking through the mechanisms by which we can do that. I I do think it's worth noting, and this isn't an excuse, and I promise it's not it's not kind of being defensive. I I would I would I would say there 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 is. Um, you know, limitations in many cases about about time and 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 the investment capacity that people can make towards understanding all of the nitty gritty details. I think to to Joelle's point earlier about you know the 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 kind of proxies we use, the the degree to which we're kind of satisfied by certain amounts of kind of um, 
deferral either to learned intermediaries to Valentin's point about who else has brought us along that we trust that says that this is okay to use. Um, you know, I think I think those are all kind of interesting perspectives. So, you know, could AI help us get better at figuring out where it is that that people really want to know things and see things and know what the the innards are and where they are just you know comfortable with 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 kind of a proxy or with some sort of certification? Maybe, but I but I I come back to the notion of the fact that you know I do think that that this behooves us to to kind of zone in on where are the 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 issues most most real who is participating and how do we kind of allow for some of that at outset and then you know how do we iterate with feedback loops that potentially teach us where there are course corrections because i i would say you know notwithstanding the deliberative democracy movement i i'm not i'm not sold that that the polity in its entirety is going to kind of get all together and and figure out you know what we're all comfortable with and kind of do it all together. I think I think we are going to need um, to be able to continue to have some capacity to be able to do this um, on behalf of, of folks and making sure that that um, that 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 includes the width and that that the right amounts of kind of engagement have occurred along the way. Would you like to add anything, Joe? I see you're unmuted, or if not, we can. Okay. So another. So let let me ask you a question. Everyone here, a question not black box related. How can we attract talent to Canada and uh, Quebec when people go to U.S. like Silicon Valley when it comes to a career in artificial intelligence? I can speak by a program that I used to to work with. I think there's a lot of interest in Quebec for AI, and there's a lot of people trying to get an opportunity in AI. So what I think we need is to make it more accessible. Like when you think about AI, you think about an engineer who spent five years in college and after he, he went to a master's and a PhD. I think that the market is actually requiring other, like some skills in AI, and you can get those skills at a different level, not necessarily at a undergrad level. So creating professional programs at the SEGEP level or, or a before or, or, or the early, early career level to give capacities or skills to people to engage with, with AI, I think that's the fastest and the most efficient way that I've seen working in Quebec. I'll add, I, I think there's a couple key moments in one's life where, you know, the question of, you know, sort of the, 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 the vocational or work aspect intersects with the geography. You know, there's the time point where people decide where to go to university or to college. That is usually a decision point of whether, you know, you're going to stay in one geography or move to somewhere else. And so being thoughtful about having the right incentives for, you know, talented Canadians to stay in Canada at that point and having the right incentives to invite people from all over the world to join our society. I think that, that you know, university, beginning of university program is one time point. And once their people are done, their university program is the other time point. So, you know, once they graduate from our universities, are they going to stay in Canada to pursue their career? I, as a university professor for many years, I saw a big shift when we started having a much stronger Canadian AI policy. I would say for the first 10 years of my career, every single one of my graduate students left Canada, master's and PhD, to go elsewhere in the world, most of them to the US. At the inflection point where we started having a very strong focus on AI, the development of the institutes, Mila, Vector, Ami, I had much stronger number of my students, both Canadian and international students, graduate students who decided to stay in Canada to pursue a career either in academia because suddenly the research was well funded either in industry so I think those are you know you have to be a little bit thoughtful about where you put in the incentive with respect to people's career trajectory and being thoughtful about you know how do we welcome the families and make this you know kind of a life project for people not just a work project because you know you want people who invest in the community and the society at large yeah, I think those are all really important points, Joelle. And I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, we have to sell the full package so that the, all of the quality of life benefits. And then second, I think we just need to continue to maintain critical mass and scale and and show the pathway through to Canadian leadership in a in a global context. And I think scale means, you know, if if 
if I'm going to move country with my family and, and, and take up a new gig, if, if the current employer goes under, is there another down the street that I can go to? Is there, and how is that, you know, placing competition on wages? How is that placing, you know, it, it all kind of comes together into ecosystems in some ways. And so we need to continue to maintain ecosystems that actually can, can flourish. So. Um, if I can add just uh, three little points in the context of the pandemic in the remote uh, work conditions and very often the lack of uh, uh, very um, AI experts who are able to implement in an actual business. Um, so beyond the level like um, below the expertise of Mila in the business world, able to implement a uh, machine learning experts, um, there's a huge uh, lack of workers. And right now there's investment models that make it conditional to uh, get the funding only if you hire in Quebec, which is ridiculous in this day and age. Uh, so again, I go back to investment models. It makes it difficult to uh, be able to get the investments for that startup um, because they have to hire in Quebec or if they hire elsewhere, then they can't hire, but even in Ontario, which is part of the Canada. So maybe like, again, looking across the government in how, uh, we can hire and, um, so not just immigration, but also looking at across province, uh, in a remote work condition. Um, also, uh, the investing in, uh, technical ability in, again, in real business world um, is, I think, a, a current um, lack that I see a lot of startups uh, suffering from and needing and implemented businesses, large businesses as well. And the, the last one, there are hiring committees, uh, for example, right now in the government to uh, accelerate the hiring of uh, uh, new Canadians who are already tech experts. And um, I was actually quite angry at the feedback I got when I proposed to have UX designers that came from different backgrounds, uh, because the back a push that um, uh, that I got was, why would that be necessary? It's going to lower with the quality of uh, of AI, and I completely disagree. I think a steam based team of UX designers increases the quality of the design of AI and the relevance of the AI technologies that we put out there. So I just wanted to add that tech talent, we need to define what we mean by tech talent. Thank you so much for all of your insight on this. And we are actually coming to an end of this event. And I would like to thank you all so much for investing your time with us tonight, this Wednesday evening. We sincerely appreciate all the insight and guidance provided by our stellar panelists. So this event is brought to you by the McGill Alumni Public Policy Society. And uh, for our, any future events and updates, please follow us on LinkedIn. And thank you so much for coming and have a wonderful evening.